I have used microaggressions against my own race. I, man, I hated being Asian growing up. I despised it. And I just remember making the crudest, most horrible jokes because in, in some way I felt like this was expected of me to make everyone feel comfortable about my adoption. What is the experience like for transracial adoptees in America? We partnered with Lionsgate on their upcoming film Joyride to hear the stories of real-life adoptees and how their experiences shaped their lives. Adopted kids are more screwed up than biological kids. Three, two, one, go. I'm really curious about you two yeah. first. Yeah. 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 I know so many biological kids <laughs> that too. are screwed <laughs> up. <laughs> <laughs> and they were raised in like a healthy, nuclear, cliche, mm. white picket fence family. Mm. And I know several adopted kids that are so successful, that are doing great. I mean, shout out Simone Biles. She went to the Olympics and she was adopted. <laughs> Can I move? Like, he changed my mind a bit. Like, Come on! Can I? I'm like, yeah. I'm like, she has a point there. I can't. No, I can I strongly disagree with that. No, no, because like, the, the thing is, she changed my mind on that because like, as a foster kid, like somebody who went through all that, we are fucked up, you know? Like, we, we go through so much, like, through that whole process, seeing and feeling neglected from like, the foster parents. But I don't let my past, where I grew up, like, define who I am to make, to make me screw, screwed up. Yeah, so um, I'm on strongly agree because I've been through a few therapeutic boarding schools, wilderness programs. One of them, I remember, it's a place where wealthy parents send their children, so it's privileged. And even with all that privilege, everybody there was messed up, like, and messed up just saying, like, the, weren't stable, whether it was a drug addiction or just like bad temper or violence. Adoptees all carry this trauma. Maybe it has something to do with identity and not knowing a lot about our background. Well, some of us not knowing a lot about our background. I think like we don't even have a birthday. And me personally going through that and growing up in a colorblind environment, um, it's kind of like we were left to fend for ourselves. And I think any child that have to fend for themselves are gonna go through some hmm. messed up shit. <laughs> hmm. But yeah. <laughs> so, thank you for sharing, by the way. I look at this question through two lenses. The adopted community as a whole is four times more at risk of suicide than non-adopted mm -hmm. counterparts. Mm -hmm. I think that adopted kids are more at risk for struggle, not because of us, but because of society and because of the dominant narrative of white saviorism that is all surrounding adoption. We all know this narrative, but the narrative for those that don't know is this notion of adoptees should feel lucky, adoptees must be grateful, and gratitude is related to this idea of repayment. The effect of that is that we as adoptees, as a whole community, feel like we're less worth than our non-adopted uh, non counterparts. It, it makes us feel like you should repay your life that you were given. You should repay mm -hmm. the fortunes that were given to you. And for little kids, how can we repay something that's immeasurable? Um, mm -hmm. And it's not fair for us as little kids to have that weight, that burden on us while growing up. And because we have that weight, because we have that burden, that's what, so to speak, messes us up. You're bringing back some stuff. I'm like, yeah. 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 like, Jesus. I chose to be on this side because I felt if I was on that side, it'd be denying my experience as an adoptee, uh, the fear of abandonment that feels inherent to being an adoptee. Because of that, I have definitely been in um, relationships I shouldn't have been in, toxic ones, and relationships for way too long. What comes with that then is like feeling like you have to prove that you're worthy of love mm -hmm. constantly mm -hmm. because of the inner voice and wounds of being abandoned as a baby, or just abandoned in general. Yeah, Those yeah, wounds could I felt be. that. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, my name is Matea. I am adopted from China in the 90s during the one child policy. So um, one thing I'm super grateful about uh, with my parents is they 
really valued making sure that my brother and I experienced our heritage. Every summer, um, we would go to this camp that uh, specifically focused on our Chinese heritage and um, taught us different aspects of it. So like language, calligraphy, dance, martial arts. And so that was a really um, special and I think important experience um, to have um, as a transracial adoptee. Hi, my name is Eli. I'm 23 years old and I was adopted from South Korea at nine months old. I have four adopted siblings also from Korea and I grew up in Denver, Colorado, so not a lot of diversity there. And I'm actually about to go look for my birth parents this fall. Hello, good humans. We hope you're enjoying this very special episode of Spectrum. I'm here with the director of this episode, Liz. <laughs> Hey everyone. We're excited to be partnering with Lionsgate in bringing together this group of transracial adoptees to promote their upcoming movie, Joyride. Joyride. This movie centers around a group of friends who embark on a crazy journey across Asia with Audrey, an Asian woman, who's adopted by white parents, to find her birth mother. And it ends up being a trip full of twists and turns that's heartfelt and hilarious. As a transracial adoptee myself, I love that an adoptee narrative can cross genres into a wild comedy. Yes. But my favorite part of it is that there's such a powerhouse cast of AAPI actors. Some of our very favorite people, like Ashley Park. Sherry Cola. Uh, Stephanie Shu, Sabrina Wu, uh, and many more surprises. There's definitely some pretty raunchy moments in the movie, but I love that it really just breaks the mold of how the API community has been portrayed on screen up until now. Yeah, it is fresh, and uh, I felt uncomfortable watching it with my mother. Uh, so please go watch with your mother. Joyride is coming out in theaters on July 7th, and you can buy your tickets now. All right, now let's get back to the episode. We'll see you guys. Bye. Transracial adoption should not be allowed. Three, two, one, go. I mean, I think it makes sense. Yeah. We're all transracial adoptees. That would be saying that you would be against your own adoption. And I think I just want to add also, it's different from being colorblind. That's not why I'm here, just to clarify. OK, theoretically, let's say we were on agree for one reason. Do you guys have any gripes against transracial adoption? Mm. Um, well, yeah, like, I, I guess like what I just said a little side. bit. Savior complex. Savior complex. I mean, there are people in the world who I think view transracial adoption as this like, oh, I'm doing a cool thing. Like, mm. I've met people who have said those specific things where they're like, mm. I've always just wanted a black child, you know, but there's, that's it, there's no like, why do you want a black child or, you know, or like, it was like a savior mentality almost. Mm. And I do think that it's really important as the further we go to have that education and to not go in with it with a colorblind stance because it does do a lot more harm, at least it did for me growing up, um, than, yeah, just opening up your kids to the culture that mm. they came from. Yeah, no, you really spoke to something. All my friends that are black or Arabic, um, have all this culture that they grew up with and they like years and years of like learning stuff and that's what I missed out on. So for the future generations and people who are adopting right now, I think the biggest thing would be to stop being colorblind because we're not helping the kids. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I agree that everybody deserves a set of parents, family, everybody deserves to be loved and nurtured and cared for. However, the recent legislation that almost didn't pass, I guess, for ICWA, which is the Indigenous Child Welfare Act, being Native American um, and not adopted by Native Americans, I don't know anything. You know, there's so much about my life that just didn't make sense until I went out and learned it myself. So I feel like that small community of Native children need to stay with other Natives. It doesn't have to be the same tribe, but just keep them Native because, you know, our population's declining. I mean, I am standing here where I am, but I do think it is a little bit of a privileged place to be standing because mm -hmm. I think the reality of adoption in the U.S. and culture in the U.S. is that it's very hard to be a person of color here in this country. You know, my parents were white. My parents being white will never understand what it's like to be a person of color in the U.S. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. And they're not going to be able to connect with me in that way, which it's kind of a big deal. Mm -hmm. Now, there are other things that they do really, really well, but the reality is living here 
is kind of tough for a person of color, and they can recognize that for me, but they can't know what my experience is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hey everyone, my name is Ben. I was adopted from China at 11 months by my dads Bill and Sam, and I grew up in New York City. Hi, my name is Nora. Uh, so a little bit about my adoption story. I was found in a dug hole in a park by a police officer when I was about, uh, I think it was a week or two old. So a little bit about my adopted parents. Um, they're both white French Canadians. My parents were infertile, they couldn't uh, have their own children. But my mother always had a strong need to be a mother and to have a family. So I think, yeah, it's always been important. So it was children or it had to be. Okay, let's mix it up. Can each of you tell me some of the crazy stuff that people have said to you as a transracial adoptee? Okay, um, who are your parents? <laughs> my parents are white, so they never know where they are in the crowd. Do you know your real parents, though? What country are you originally from? Oh, yeah. Where are you from from? I just get made fun of being adopted, so I would say my parents chose me. Yours just stuck with what they got. <laughs> <laughs> You're so lucky. Congrats. Oh, that was a big one. People would literally be like, congratulations. Mm. Mm. For what? <laughs> Are your parents coming to the parent meeting conference? They never came. Or are they coming to your football game? They never came. Mm. For me, it actually comes from other Asians. So the microaggressions, it's like, yeah, Eli's white. Or, hey, if we go to a potluck, you can bring them a meatloaf, right? Reset. <laughs> trauma throwing. Yeah. It should be trauma dump moment right there. Yeah, yeah. but adoptees can laugh at that, right? Yeah, I mean, yeah. yeah. no. We all, we all, yeah. The yeah. amount of dark We're humor good. we go through, like, I mean, come on, it's, it's very common. Yeah. How's it going? My name is Prodigy. I'm actually 21 years old. I went through the adoption process a lot later than other people. Like, I went through the foster care system. Basically, how it all started for me was having a little bit of problems at the start with my own family and it led to me being taken away from, you know, from my mother. So I'm Nicaraguense and I'm Honduran, and my adoptive parents, they're actually Salvadorian. And, you know, even though we are from the same branch in Central America, at the end of the day is that everybody has their different cultures, like with Nicaragua and Honduras, like they were at war at some point, same with Nicaragua and El Salvador. So at first it was a little bit of trouble, but at the end of the day, like, they're still my family. I can still go to their house and eat on the same table with them. But like I said, I'm a proud Hispanic. I have used microaggressions against my own race. Oof. Three, two, one, go. I think when I was younger, there was definitely some jokes that I made, which I deeply regret, but trust me, I'm picking up the slack now, but I think it's also the fact that I was growing up countryside in like a predominantly white place made it so that like I accepted a lot of things, little comments or little jokes that I would just let slide or people using the N-word. And I think when I started learning more about black culture, um, that's when I was like, okay, that's really not okay and this is why. But I think that also comes with maturity and age. So I'm on strongly agree because I, man, I hated being Asian growing up. I despised it, man. My dad would give me a buzz cut. I had glasses. And so every time I went out, we just kind of would get looks because there's five adopted kids. And man, I just remember making the crudest, most horrible jokes um, because it, in a weird way, validated me as like, in Asian almost, because in, in some way I felt like this is what was expected of me to make these jokes, to make these comments, to make everyone laugh and feel comfortable about my adoption. And what I realized is, dang, like first off, I'm starting to believe this stuff. Second off, I'm, I'm doing it in service of others. Like I'm making these jokes to make other people feel comfortable. I do identify with your story as well. Um, I grew up also like hating that I was Asian, but like specifically Chinese, um, I would hear like kind of a negative connotation about Chinese that like they're liars and they're ugly and also being around predominantly uh, white community and like in high school, like hanging out with a lot of group of girls that were often white and I was the token Asian, like just 
made me more and more hate my appearance and not think that I was attractive. I guess with being insecure with that, it's almost like, yeah, that internalized racism and like self-hatred um, that happens. So that's why I am on this side as well. Oh, can I add one thing to that? Yeah. Like totally, totally, totally resonant with what both of you guys were saying. I was always proud to be Asian. I was proud of my differences. But I think it was always interesting reckoning with this idea of being proximal to whiteness. And what I mean by that is when white people growing up said, oh, like you're basically white, they were saying that to validate me as being like a, a first class citizen because I'm like almost white because I was raised in a white family. And then when Asians would call me a banana or when Asians would say, yeah. oh, well, you're, you're not really Asian. Um, that would hurt yeah. on a different level. Yeah, I would get uh, that too. Because, of course, we are Asian. And yeah, it just feels incredibly invalidating. I mean, for me, like, I'm on strongly disagree because I'm a proud Hispanic. Like, I'm Nicaraguense and I'm Honduran, and I'm always going to be proud of that no matter what. And I get how some people can be like, oh, my race, like, it falls in my bloodline that, like, there's alcoholism, drug addicts, but I'm never going to let that define my anger or my percentage of how I am or how I represent myself ever. Yes. Uh, so I would say with my family, like cousins, grandparents, all of that, um, the conversation of my adoption didn't really start happening until like when Mike Brown was shot. That was kind of the first time that I really felt invalidated by my own family because um, I think I was trying to get them to recognize like I'm a black woman and there are people right now who look like me that are going through very traumatic things. Um, but my family didn't view it that way. I felt very invisible. Yeah, I didn't have anyone to relate to. Um, all my family comes from a really small town in the Midwest, mm -hmm. um, like 95% white. And to the point where like the KKK, it used to be a sundown town, like that kind of mm -hmm. thing. Um, and so, yeah, I, growing up, it just went from, I was just kind of there as Michaela, but not a black person. It was more of just like, they would always say to me is like, I don't see you as black. I just, 100%. yeah, you know, all and. All the other time. And yeah. I was happy, I, I was glad, yes. I was like, Yes, I'm not right. gonna like be a victim of racism. Like, yeah, yes. at the time, it, exactly, yeah. It never bothered me at the time, but I think the more I processed it, the older I got, I realized how damaging that mm -hmm. term is because I mean, I think we've all experienced this of like, who am I? And so then I was like, okay, if these, my family doesn't see me as black, what am I? You know, that was like the question that I still sometimes think today even, that's like always in the back of my head, so mm -hmm. yeah. 100%. So true. Hi, I'm Michaela. I was adopted two days after I was born in the suburbs of Indianapolis by a single white mother. Um, I met my birth family when I was 18 years old. I found them on Facebook and it was definitely a whirlwind of emotions. I went from basically just being me to finding out I have five siblings and like hundreds of family members that all tried to contact me within the span of 24 hours. So it was a pretty overwhelming experience and I'm 27 now. But yeah, I'm hoping again to have just to build a relationship with them in the future. Hi, I'm Chris. I was adopted when I was four years old by Polish immigrants. They had just immigrated to America in the early 90s and decided that they wanted children. Um, and due to medical reasons, they were unable to conceive. So they adopted a little Native American baby, which is me. <laughs> Nature is stronger than nurture. Three, two, one, go. I know. Well, nature is stronger than nurture. So your genetics exactly... are stronger than how you were raised. Oh, yeah. okay. This is confusing. <laughs> I you said it. You said it correctly, we just... Yeah. Yeah, it's just all the trauma, you know? Um, I want to know, like, why do you agree, like, out of everybody here, you know? So I was raised by conservative Christian parents, and I do not look like a conservative Christian whatsoever. Mm. Growing up in a very strict, no alcohol, no drugs, no gambling, no tattoos, being gay is not okay, marriage is for a man and a woman, here I am, you know, in a same-sex relationship, covered in tattoos. Both of my biological parents suffered tremendously with their mental health. 
Um, they were in and out of, you know, mental facilities. I mean, not to be cliche, but two out of ev every three Native Americans struggles with addiction. And I did struggle with homelessness and addiction, just like my parents did. I read the Bible cover to cover growing up, and I still made the choices and had the journey that I had. I'm, I'm neutral for the fact that, like, at some point it was nature genetically. My dad drank a little bit. My mom, she suffered through mental health. And, you know, I remember being a kid seeing all of that. But I don't let that define me because genetically, like I said, you can stop genetically the nature of what you're surrounding. That's exactly what I'm trying to do. I'm the first person in my biological family to go to college. You know, I, you know, thank you, just got accepted to a UC. Yo, thank you, thank you. It's never too late to get an education. But, you know, like, um, I'm on that path trying to make a better life for myself. Yeah. Being a criminologist, um, nature versus nurture is one of the biggest dilemmas. And after almost 10 years studying, I'm here because I see that environment affects people tremendously. Whether you're still with your biological parents, whether you're adopted, foster care, it doesn't matter. For example, crime or criminality can be developed by your environment. If you grew up in like white suburbia, white picket fans, a lot of money, or if you grew up or in a family where everybody is gang related, who has the who is going has more chance of developing criminality, right? And it's not necessarily who your parents are or your bloodline. So that's why I'm <laughs> on who here. you surround yourself with. Yeah. Um, so I met my biological family um, when, yeah, when I was 18. I went to a family reunion. That was kind of like my first big thing where I like met everyone, um, like over 100 people. I went by myself. I definitely felt out of place. I was like, these are the people who are my blood and I look like them, but I also felt like a stranger still. Um, and I think that just goes into the identity piece that made it even harder for me because I was like, I finally met my birth family, but these people do not feel like family at all. Um, but also my birth dad, there's things that I see in him, especially like when I'm angry, we act the same. Or like there's things from my birth mom that we just both like, like she grew up doing that I've noticed that I do as well. So I definitely think there are things that like I've seen from my family that I've noticed in me, but I also still feel like a stranger at the same time. I feel like also like children, babies, like we mimic a lot. Yeah. So like even, I know this is about transracial adoptions, but if you look at just same race adoption, people would be like, you're adopted, but you look so much like your parents. Or you, yes. They get that all the time. Well, it's, be, it's because you have the same mannerisms. I have the same mannerisms as my mom. Like, but people won't really seek those out or look for that or notice it because I'm, my parents, my mom is white and I'm black. I am very much like my dad and very logical, very emotional like my mother. I've not gotten the chance to meet my birth family yet. I also grew up very, very Christian, very, very conservatively, and I think that did impact me quite a bit. So I, I think that it's a push and pull for certain things that are nature and versus certain things that are nurture. So I don't think there's an answer for it, but in terms of transracial adoption, I do want to think about the point of why the question was asked in the first place, which I don't quite understand where the question's coming from. Blood, yeah, blood, blood versus not blood. Blood versus water. There you go. <laughs> oh, well, well, uh, well, my tangent is a really long tangent, so I Go actually... for it. I'm lost. <clears throat> okay. <laughs> <laughs> so I totally agree that we have like different brain chemistries, like I'm predisposed to maybe being a little bit more confident or maybe more happy or whatever it may be. There's neurodiversity. That being said, I don't like this question and maybe this is why, what you're getting at. I don't like this question because I think it takes away the responsibility of community, of environment, of society, and of government. And what I mean by that is when we were born in some place and we had no choice to be born, and then we, when we were displaced and brought up in a completely new environment, there is responsibility for the people closest to us and for the community and the neighborhood to be supporting and championing that person and seeing them not as the ones that are lucky or are grateful, but seeing them as the people that are strong and are resilient and people that we should champion in the society. Um, 
And that's the responsibility of the people that made a choice that we didn't make as adoptees. Yeah, so I, you know, I, I contest this question by saying, who cares about nature versus nurture? Nurture is pretty darn important. Mm. I think it's more important than nature. I feel like you have to understand the nature in order to correctly nurture. Mm. Because mm. if you don't nurture based on nature, you might not like educate them correctly. Mm. Yes, yeah, really well said. I'm very happy to be yeah. celebrating everyone's differences That's today. Mm -hmm. Hearing each of your stories and the impact that I know you guys are making in your personal lives, like it's very cool. And just know that I'm celebrating you today. Yeah. Yes. Good shit, yeah. guys. Yeah. I'm just happy I can finally have mm. trauma buddies to talk to this about, you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. Adoption on three. Trauma on three. One, two, three, trauma. <laughs>